Hi, everybody. I'm Adam Kuyper, editor of The New Atlantis, and I'm in our offices here in Washington, D.C. with Roger Scruton, a contributing editor to The New Atlantis and a fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center. Roger is the author of many books, some four dozen, and uh, we're going to talk today about his latest, which is a novel. Those of you who are familiar with Roger's polemical and political writing, or his writing in philosophy and religion, art and aesthetics, might be surprised to hear about the subject of his new novel, a time and a place he knows intimately well. The new book is called Notes from Underground. We'll turn to this in just a moment, but before we do, Roger, I want to uh, ask you about an article that you wrote that we published not long ago in the New Atlantis on another subject. It's called Scientism in the Arts and the Humanities. Now, people know what science is. Could you explain the term scientism? Yes. Uh, uh, science, um, actually, is harder to explain than scientism, uh, but I assume that we have the idea of scientific method as a method whereby we uh, advance towards the explanation of things through collecting data and experiment, uh, through trial and error, through forming hypotheses and so on. And I think we're all familiar with this method in one form or another, although it's very difficult to put in words exactly what it, con it consists, consists in. But scientism, in my understanding, is the pretense of scientific method when addressing questions which are not themselves scientific. They're not questions about uh, the nature of physical reality or how you explain the phenomena that, um, the, uh, or the data that you collect. Uh, now, uh, there are plenty of such questions as we know. I mean, the question, what should I do in a dilemma, is quite obviously not a scientific question. I don't solve it by consulting uh, any theory, I, I ask myself what would be the right thing to do, and I, and I perhaps enter into dialogue with others who give me advice. Uh, so that, that's a very simple example of a non-moral question, a non-scientific question, because it's moral. But there are a lot of other questions uh, which we don't immediately think to be scientific, but we hope that maybe there'll be a science that will answer them for us. Uh, for, for instance, uh, the, the question of you know, what, what is the meaning of Michelangelo's David? That incredible lump of stone in which so much strength seems to be concentrated in one little part of it, uh, and that incredible concentration in the face. So, um, we all know this is a very meaningful thing, but we haven't got any clear method for understanding exactly how we find that meaning. So people come along with with uh, pseudo-scientific theories, you know, like structuralism or something, say that you know the, the meaning of it is embedded in its structure, and here are the principles, you know, uh, uh, which look like uh, you know, sort of uh, some some form of, of computer code, whereby we extract uh, from the appearance of the of the sculpture its meaning for us. And I think in the arts there are a lot of such attempts to impose scientific categories on questions that are not themselves scientific. There's, there's surely some space for the empirical to inform our understanding of questions that are ethical or of, of our understanding of the arts and the humanities, but uh, w w how do we know uh, where we ought to limit the use of empirical or of, or of scientific mm. approaches to these kinds of questions? What is, what's, where, where should we draw lines? Well, obviously in the humanities, um, as the name suggests, uh, we need information about what human beings are. That's part of our data uh, and what their choices and their preferences are. But we also need to know how to argue about those choices and preferences, how to discover the human significance of things. That's where the temptation exists to, as it were, reach out for some ready-made science which will tell us without doing the exploration that we need to do of our own states of mind. You know, uh, what is it that I feel towards this? How would I put that into words? How would I justify it to you? And how would I respond to your counter um, account of it? 
So I'd, I'd welcome viewers to read this article, Scientism and the Arts and the Humanities, which concludes with, among other things, a, a lovely uh, takedown of meme theory, which you mm -hmm. really kind of take to task for its, uh, mm -hmm. it being an example of the kind of scientism uh, and overreach of the scientific method. I, I want to turn now to the book. Right. Uh, it's, it's called Notes from Underground. Uh, and I just want to start with the title. Obviously, Dostoevsky wrote uh, a, a book with that exact name, mm. uh, which plays a part in this story. Yes. So why that name? Well, the hero of this book, if you can call him a hero, um, it, it is a young Czech boy growing up in the bleak period that preceded the fall of communism in the 1980s. Uh, he's been deprived of any educational resources because his father of his father's uh, dissident profile uh, and he's looking for a way to educate himself and has come across this book by Dostoevsky the title itself already appeals to him because he feels that uh, you know being cut off from the the world of normal and natural people uh, and uh, he, he has had to find the meaning of things uh, in some kind of catacomb beneath the city and he's He's, he thinks of himself as locked in that catacomb. He finds it in the um, Prague uh, subway uh, uh, and fantasizes all his relations with other people in that subway. So gradually the underground idea uh, takes possession of him. And when he meets somebody who, who seems to be reaching down to him from above, from the, from the world of light and lifting him out of his darkness, he immediately um, gives himself completely to her. Could you say a little bit more about this this love story, which you depict? Um, on the one hand, it's very very tenderly described, uh, but it's also there's something very uh, evanescent about it. Yes, well, I, I was interested when writing this book because it describes a situation which I knew quite well, although I couldn't live in that country then. I, but I could visit it, and I had friends there, uh, and uh, I learnt the language enough to communicate with them and read their letters and so on. So I, I had a very strong sense of, uh, of what people were longing for. You know, the, the, some kind of uh, uh, truthfulness and reality in their relations with each other, even though they knew that they couldn't wholly trust each other. Uh, at every point, uh, the, the secret police would either to have an advantage if you confessed to them or were, had their eyes on someone else who would do it for you. So that everybody was in a state of uh, of longing towards each other, longing for that pure and truthful connection, uh, combined with um, an intransigent suspicion of the other. There was no way in which you could ever get that. So uh, it was a very poignant situation. That is why I chose these two young people who were drawn to each other, both longing for that truth, but both, of course, deeply embedded in a situation which prevented them from obtaining it. Yeah, and uh, you you depict it the, the relationship. Uh, it's it's it to the reader. It it almost seems like it's always just a little bit uh, out of touch. Mm. It's kind of always just it, it's always a little bit away from you. It kind of pushes away again mm. and again. Uh, so um, you mentioned as you were answering the last question that you uh, you know this time and this mm. place well that this is a place that you visited, which I think maybe a lot of our viewers aren't familiar with, mm. the, the fact that you were really involved in the dissident movement and were presumably watched by the secret police mm. yourself. What was the nature of your involvement? Well, I and a few friends set up, the, uh, set up an underground university in um, Czechoslovakia, as it then was. This was 80... Uh, in the early 1980s, and we car carried on through the 80s, not expecting what happened suddenly in 1989. Nobody expected right. it, actually, but simply to offer to young people like the hero of my book uh, the education which, of which they had been deprived and which had been forbidden to them, actually, and also to sustain those people who were trying to write proper literature, paint proper, proper paintings, compose proper music and so on against the official um, blanket of, of nonsense. And um, so, uh, you know, I was involved in that and, and took it very seriously. It was part of my life. And, um, uh, and through that, I got a very 
powerful sense of what the underground seminars and the underground networks actually meant to young people who had been deprived of everything. Uh, and uh, that, so I felt that I really wanted to convey this to people now. We, this is the 25th anniversary now of the fall of the Berlin Wall. People are forgetting it. Um, in fact, many of the young, most active people around us today never uh, knew it because they were born after that. Uh, and, you know, let's face it, in, in the Western world, people uh, become their most energetic and their most ambitious, they're most determined to be something age 25. Unfortunately, there's four years confiscated from them by stupid universities, so they're a bit later than people were then. But still, um, there they are at 25, and th these people don't know quite what they have, uh, what, they, what things might have been for them and how they've escaped from a situation in which there was an, uh, uh, you know, a, a resolute desire in, in the Soviet authorities to impose that on all of us. I want to come back to that in a, in a moment, but first uh, let me turn for a second to the Czech Republic today. Mm. 25 years later, it must be a very different place than the Czechoslovakia that you described yes. here. What, how, how would you say the Czech Republic is different today? How, just the, the, the air you breathe, the places you walk, what's, what, is, what, is it, what is the feeling of that kind of freedom? What is it like concretely? Well, this is part of the theme of the book because it's, it's, the, it's, the narrator is that hero, uh, that, that boy from the 1980s, who's narrating it from a, uh, in retrospect, from a position in modern America, long after the liberation of his country, and uh, seeing something that he'd lost. You know, he's get, they've of course gained freedom and uh, uh, and peaceful relations with the wider world, the ability to travel and all that. He has settled in Washington uh, among people who are dedicated to the to the kind of cheerful, immediate forms of relationship that Americans engage in, but where that thing that he knew, which was a kind of poignant need for loyalty and commitment and for truth in, an, in a world where truth was hard to obtain and dearly paid for, that has, has been lost. So he's looking back with, I mean, it's a bit, you know, it's the nostalgia thing, but it's a bit deeper than that, in my view. He's looking back to a spiritual condition in which uh, real connection with the other was wanted and withheld but nevertheless glimpsed uh, and he feels he's met, entered an unreal world to some extent that is true when i go back to to prague now it, it compared with the reality that i knew then it, it is sort of unreal uh, it has that uh, as many people think of modern america that that um, e easygoing nature which makes it look as though nothing was actually uh, seriously intended you it's know. a strange paradox of freedom. In Absolutely, fact. and I think um, you know the kind of freedom that we enjoy in America is a wonderful thing, a wonderful gift, but it comes with a cost. You know, and the cost is the old way of life in which people needed each other and uh, needed each other seriously in order to manage from day to day. So then, uh, let's end maybe with this question: If I don't want to reduce. The, the, the novel, which is actually very rich uh, with a, a, a great detail that illustrates every part of, uh, of, the, of the kinds of lives that you're talking about. I don't want to reduce it to something simply didactic, but mm. uh, if, if you were looking for uh, a kind of way of thinking about life mm. uh, that a 25-year-old reader might, uh, might get out of this book and a way of thinking differently about oh, the way he or she is living uh, life today. What would you? How would you try to describe uh, the lesson there about how to how to live, you know, freely, but also with a kind of truthful, earnest passion? Well, gosh, I wish I could answer that. I mean, uh, it's not the job of a novelist to give answers, but just to present uh, the question. Uh, and I, I would say, however, if I were to attempt to say anything about this, that. Uh, that what in that situation young people turned to, which was a sense of uh, of transcendental significance in things, that the the earth, ha the world, having a significance that we human beings don't just create from moment to moment. That sense is something that is actually as necessary to young people now 
as it was then, and it's easily uh, obscured by the the flood of uh, of luxuries and merchandise and the easygoing uh, uh, transitions from relationship to relationship and so on, which we're all familiar with. Uh, and, um, you know, the, the human soul actually is not nourished uh, on uh, on transitions. It's nourished on, uh, on permanent possessions. Roger Scruton, thank you so much. The book is Notes from Underground. And may it sell many copies and bring great success. Thank you so much. Thank you.